Yeah, I mean, I didn't even want to like, I didn't even want to go to Italy with JT. Like Italy's not even that cool. I didn't didn't want to go. So I'm not even. I'm not even bitter about it. I'm just cool. It's cool. I'm cool. We're good. We're good. We're all good. Welcome back. Pushing performance family. It's Phil here and I am truly, 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 truly flying solo today because JT went to Italy. And I guess my invite got lost in the mail because I am still sitting in my office in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. But we persevere. We keep pushing, as some might say. And I've decided to use this this couple of weeks while JT is gone to just absolutely ramble, but hopefully not too hard, on one of my absolute favorite topics, and that is vertical integration. The periodization strategy that I think that literally makes sense for every single person, no matter who they are, no matter what their goal is, they should 1000% be utilizing a vertical integration periodization strategy, at least for a majority of their training year or, or annual training calendar, whatever quadrennial, whatever, whatever their period of time they're training on. They should be using vertical integration. So first things first, what the heck is vertical integration? And at the most simple level, vertical integration is all it means is that you're training all relevant qualities at all times throughout the year, right? So what this looks like in a lot of athletic populations is after doing a needs analysis, you look at. All right, what are the most important physical qualities that they need, right? It might be speed. It might be strength. It might be something that's maybe a little bit less tangible, a little bit more uh, phenomenological, like resilience, um, reducing injury risk, whatever that might be. Maybe it's some sort of capacity from an energy system standpoint. And all those things are going to be in the program all year round, right? So even if I'm in an early off season, I might be in a quote unquote foundational phase of training where my goal might be just building back up work capacity primarily. Well, I'm still going to sprint. I'm still going to jump. I'm still going to throw. I'm still going to touch on some heavier loads. It just is going to be in lower volumes, right? So all relevant qualities are in the training program just to different volumes. And I liken this to something like a weekly budget. Um, and I'm probably not the most qualified person to be talking about a weekly budget. But, you know, if I have $100 to invest each week into four or five qualities that I want to train, and the qualities that I invest in the most will have the highest return on investment in this scenario. And in this scenario, return on investment means adaptation, right? So if I want to train strength, I want to train hypertrophy. I want to train a little bit of power and I want to train aerobic capacity. So I, those are the four things. Those are the four qualities that I want to include throughout the year because I've deemed, I've deemed that this is important for my client, my athlete, whoever this person is. Well, if I invest you know, $100 into strength, I'm going to get damn strong over four weeks, eight weeks, whatever it is. But I'm also going to detrain or at the very least not make any progress and not maintain the other three qualities that I'm not hitting on. So I might take $30, put it on strength. I might take $30, put it on hypertrophy. Then I'll take 10, put it on power. I'll put the remaining 20 and put that on aerobic capacity. Hopefully, if my math is correct, that has gotten me to $100 spent. And I do that week over week. Now the qualities like power, the qualities like aerobic capacity that are on the back burner are just being maintained. Right. So I might not be making massive gains or massive adaptations in that in those regards, but I'm maintaining those qualities year round. And and before we get into, you know, what this is based on and, and and you know, what are the benefits, I just really quickly wanted to touch on where this came from. Because I was having an interesting reflection today, you know, 
it was very popularized by Charlie Francis that he used this with sprinters. He uses Ben Johnson, but the first time I, I really actually utilized this strategy was in CrossFit, right? And, and thinking back to my my level one certification, and at a broad level. CrossFit is a vertically integrated program, right? If you look at CrossFit's original methodology, right, how it was intended to be performed or when they first started back in the day, you know, at a very broad level, they're going to train weightlifting. So snatch and clean and jerk and derivatives, the power lifts and derivatives. They're going to train gymnastics uh, or, or what they would call gymnastics, which is, is very, very, very rudimentary gymnastics. So it's you know, inverting yourself on your hands in different positions. It's, it's hanging from pull-up bars. It's, it's basically body weight competency. And we're going to train what they would call monostructural, which is essentially just energy system development. So I'm running, rowing, biking, ski erg for various intensities, for various durations. Um, and and now it's, that is kind of what they put in the monostructural bucket. But if I you know, zoom in and, and get a little bit more granular, right, they're training strength, they're training power, they're training you know, body weight competency, again, kind of phenomenological, but they're training technique uh, and they're training all conditioning zones in the same month, really, really throughout the entire year. And if you look at some of the, the best and the most effective CrossFit programs over the long term, they kind of just look like vertically integrated strength and conditioning programs right? Like, you know, on some days you might have a weightlifting derivative and a short and fast Metcon, right? Where I'm just ripping it. On some days, it's just a longer Metcon that maybe mixes in some weightlifting, that mixes in some gymnastics, but it's almost borderline zone two or zone three with the intensity level that you're hitting during that longer, more aerobic Metcon, right? On some days, it might just be strength and accessory. So I'm hitting a ton of strength and then I'm doing things that look like hypertrophy, right? Or, or maybe, you know, some specific local endurance, some specific work capacity that is related to that strength, right? So, and then again, when I say it looks like a, a you know, good strength and conditioning program, meaning that these qualities or these movements are going to progress week over week. So I can see tangible improvement over time. And again, like all good vertically integrated programs, as you go throughout the CrossFit season, they're changing the dial up and down on the qualities that they're training, right? So, you know, if I'm in the quote unquote off season away from the CrossFit Open, which is a, I don't know how many weeks it is now, but back in, back in my day, it was a five week competition that, that happened in March, you know, during the CrossFit Open, we're leading up to the CrossFit Open. We're we're doing a ton of conditioning. We're doing kind of Metcon specific stuff and just maintaining the strength, just maintaining um, some of the aerobic capacity stuff. But then as you get away from that, well, I'm yeah, I'm still hitting Metcons, but I'm going to go into my weaknesses. So for me, I would just hit heavy strength during that phase. I'd still do a few Metcons a week, but that's on the back burner. But I'm not I'm not allocating a ton of my budget to that. And then I'm spending a ton of time on aerobic capacity, right? So strength, aerobic capacity, those are two qualities I want to train, but power, still being trained. Technique, still being trained. Gymnastics, still being trained. I'm still touching on those things, but just at a very low level, almost like a maintenance volume because I'm keeping it on the back burner, right? But it wouldn't be a Phil CrossFit story if I didn't talk about a really poorly vertically integrated program, right? And, and you know, before I got to this point, Again, you do a knees analysis. And when you're new to a sport like CrossFit, or if you're looking at a high school athlete, right, what do they stink at? Well, shit, everything. So what do you do in that, in, in that instance? Well, I'm just going to take four different programs that train four different things and just slap them together, right? So I was on a squat program. I was on a weightlifting program. I was on a gymnastics muscle-up program. And I was on an aerobic conditioning program. And instead of changing any of the volumes, I just try to maximize all those adaptations at the same time. And what do you think happened? As you can imagine, I absolutely broke myself, right? And, and granted, it works, right? So you know, it worked up into a certain point, but you can only adapt to so much training volume. And I think that's probably one of the, the biggest principles is that this is based on is this concept of adaptation currency, right? 
the human body can only handle so much stress. It can only adapt to so much stress. Hence why we can't just try to maximize all these qualities at the same time. Right. So, you know, in line with, with what principles is it based on, you know, obviously like all great periodization models or all great programming tactics is based on specificity, right? Meaning that we adapt to the things that we continually do. The other major thing that it's based on is reversibility, right? This concept that qualities detrain over time. So looking at power and, and you know, there's, there's varying ranges, but I think Ishrin's model, you know, looking at detraining rates of power is somewhere between five and 10 days. You start to lose power. Strength can be around 21 to 30 days. Aerobic capacity can be around 30 to 45 days, even though I've seen some things recently that kind of fly in the face of that a little bit. Let's just use that number. But we know qualities detrain over time. Technique detrains to a certain degree over time, right? If I don't do a movement for a long period of time, if I don't sprint or jump for a long period of time and then try to do it at maximal intensity, guess what? I'm not going to be as good at it from a technical standpoint as I was when I was doing it before. Because you get good or you maintain your level with the things that you do consistently, right? And there's also this concept of the repeated bout effect that we need to think about as well, right? And I, I have this joke with coaches all the time, but you know, for a new client who comes in and they do lunges, I don't care if they do body weight, they're cooked if they haven't done lunges in a year or two, right? Their body's not used to that specific stressor, right? So sprinting, hand up, definitely example for me and something that I've dealt with multiple times in my old guy track club, old guy athletic club, but I might be you know, spending a ton of time playing tennis and I might not hit a 30 or 40 yard sprint throughout two, three months. Then I go and do that. Guess what happens? I'm sore as hell, right? Because again, my body is not used to experiencing that stressor. So one of the benefits of you know, trying to keep reversibility in mind is that we take advantage of the repeat about effect. So whenever you want to turn the dial up on a quality, you're shifting phases of training and say, I'm going from a hypertrophy, more a more hypertrophy focus phase into a more strength focus phase. I'm going to slowly turn the dial up on strength. Well, I've touched heavy loads recently, albeit the volume is low, but I've still touched them, right? So from a nervous system standpoint, from a connective tissue standpoint, from a muscular standpoint, I'm severely, severely, severely reducing the amount of soreness and fatigue and potential injury risk that I would get from just, just going headfirst into a strength phase after not having done any strength work in the previous phase. So I think it's a, a big, big positive of this. And the other principle that I, I think, you know, at the time these things didn't exist, but the, the Renaissance periodization volume landmarks, which are, are things that I really like to call out because I think they're really helpful, even if it's just from a theoretical standpoint. So looking at things like maintenance volume or maximum recoverable volume or maximal adaptive volume or minimum effective volume, right? These are the things um, that the folks over at RP talk about in regards to their hypertrophy programs or their powerlifting programs. But I think this is basically the same concept that we're keeping in mind in a good vertically integrated program, right? I might put strength to my you know, maximum adaptive volume. I might put some sort of power to the minimum effective volume. I'm going to put hypertrophy to maintenance volume, which for most muscle groups and, and is going to be pretty low. And I might put my you know, ESD work to maintenance volume, right? In a specific phase. And then as I progress throughout the training year, I can turn the dial up or down or, or change where I'm allocating my budget as far as qualities go based on what is the quality that I want to train during this specific phase. And I think... You know, this is a concept that I got from, from Malden Yovanovic, a strength training manual. I think I've said a couple of times on here that, that that's my favorite book, and I will talk about it at nauseum if someone asks me about it. But this is the most robust approach that we can take to training, right? Including all the relevant qualities throughout the training year is just so robust, right? And, and what I mean by that is it, it really is a great way to, to almost cover our own asses, right? Like I'm not going to go all in on power knowing that 
they probably need some things other than power to play a, a dynamic and chaotic sport like football, like baseball. Like I probably should do some kind of hypertrophy things in there to reduce injury risk throughout the year. I probably should do some mobility and stability related things, even just strength training through full ranges of motion, whatever it might be to, you know, keep them healthy and robust, keep them, keep, give them more movement options throughout the training year, right? Like, you know, keeping these things in the program just goes a, a, a long way to ensuring that our athletes are going to be healthy throughout the training year, right? And in even an athletic population, but especially in the general population, shit happens. We miss workouts, right? We miss maybe long periods of time. So keeping this more robust approach, again, covers our asses during those periods of time, right? Because Let's say, and, and how I generally do it is I'll, I'll tend to keep these qualities all on the same day. So, you know, I'd have my warm up. I'd probably pre to my warm up. I'd probably do some specific, you know, mobility and stability work. Again, that's a quality that I will keep in my program year round, different volumes. Then I'll do some power stuff, jumps and throws. Then I'll do a heavy lift. And then I'll do right now in this phase, I'm doing a lot of longer isometrics and things like that just for tissue capacity and a little bit of local endurance and there's some connective tissue health. So all those things live in the program to varying degrees throughout the year. So if I miss a Monday and a Tuesday, you know, Thursday, Friday, whatever days I'm training, I'm touching, just lightly touching on those things. And my jumps might be one set. My throws might be one set, maybe two, right? Again, maintenance volume, right? What do I need to maintain the quality? I just need to hit it, right? So I almost think about it as like an extension of the warm up. And right now, my goal primarily is getting stronger in the weight room uh, and playing around with some different RDL variations, playing around with different heavy lunge variations, just as a little bit of fun, right? Just as a little bit of switch from, from my training, from doing a lot of jumping and sprinting. So, you know, with that in mind, again, you know, I miss a day, I miss two days. It's all good because when I come back to my training day, I know I'm seeing all these qualities. So if you have a client who's inconsistent, it's a great way to make sure that, shoot, no matter what day they come in, they come in two days a week, they come in one day a week, they come in five days a week. I'm taking this robust approach. So I'm at the very least maintaining their fitness level or their, their capacity and whatever relevant qualities are needed for their goal you know, during this, this kind of time where they're missing sessions. So you know, I, my, that's, again, kind of just my bias of taking this you know, robust approach and, 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 you know, trying to, trying to be prepared for when shit hits the fan, knowing that it's 1000% going to, right. That's almost unavoidable within, uh, you know, the lives of an S and C coach, the lives of a personal trainer, just working with human beings, even in a sports schedule, their practice schedule is going to get hectic, right. Their, their personal life's going to get hectic, right. We're all humans. Shit's going to hit the fan. So that's why I just generally like to take a more robust strategy. But then the kind of question becomes, you know, how can you start to implement this com concept? And I think it, it's, it's pretty straightforward and easy to implement. And it's not too dissimilar, you know, from a, a start to finish as you would do for any other style of periodization, any other style of programming. I mean, to be honest, I, I would probably wager that a lot of you listening are already doing some form of a vertically integrated program like i think we talked about this on the periodization episode but there's not that many like true block programs out there there's not that many true linear programs or true undulating programs they all have some sort of mix of of conjugation and undulation and block and linear like in the practical world it's all kind of a hodgepodge. So generally speaking, as much as I like to nerd out about programming and periodization, I, I think like arguing programming theory for theory's sake gets kind of dumb um, and isn't, doesn't bear much fruit. Like if you're arguing about it from a practical standpoint, yeah, that makes sense. But arguing about it from a theoretical standpoint, you know, that's not really how a lot of programs come to life anyway. So I don't think it's that helpful. But Sorry for that aside, back to implementing this concept. Again, you do a needs analysis, you find their starting point, you iterate over time, right? It's, it's really no different than 
any other program, any other periodization strategy. So in your needs analysis, you decide what are the relevant qualities that they need for their goal, their sport, their position, whatever it is, right? So I'm looking at the sport, right? They're a linebacker. Cool. What does a linebacker need to be able to do? And what can they do relative to their peers, right? Cool. Their goal is weight loss. Their goal is health. What activities do they like to do outside of their goal? What are some relevant qualities for aging and longevity? So again, I'm looking at you know strength and power. And then we can pick a starting point. So, all right, where are we right now in the timeline of their life, of their season? What's the most important thing for us to train right now? Or potentially, you know, what might take the longest to improve is always a good starting point with people. And then from there, we start to iterate, right? I, I want to test and retest, test, learn, apply over time because everyone's going to respond to things differently, right? And that's kind of the, the, the biggest note I want to hit on before we go into an actual example or examples of what this looks like. Everyone responds to stimuli differently, right? Some people love heavy strength work and can tolerate a ton of it. Five by five, 10 by three, 90%, it don't matter, right? They, their, their nervous system is built for that. Their, their levers are built for that. They can handle a ton of heavy strength work and they love it. Some people love reactive and short ground contact time plyos. So drop jumps, continuous jumps, pogo jumps, whatever it is, sprinting. They love it. They can handle a ton of it, right? Some people are in the middle. Some people love volume work. Some people hate volume work, right? Again, it's all going to be kind of dependent upon the person and their capacity. So some of this is based on their training age. Some of this is probably based on factors that we don't even fully understand, like some epigenetic stuff. But again, this is why we have to iterate. We got to test, learn, and apply, right? So I'm going to implement this program and I'm going to continue to monitor over time, right? Like what truly is the minimum effective volume for strength work for this person? Like, let me, let me see how low we can take it and still see progress. What is the minimum effective volume of plyometrics that I can do for this person, right? Let, let's see where it's at and, and work over time, right? Like personally, I've learned through my, for myself, doing something as little as almost, you know, 30 to 50 contacts a week on a counter movement jump is enough to slowly and incrementally raise my counter movement jump, right? I'm also doing some other qualities in there as well, but that's enough for me right now, kind of my minimum effective volume per week to slowly raise my jump, right? And I've done phases where I've done, you know, 150 contacts in a week and try to hammer it and saw a rapid increase. And I've done phases where I stick to that kind of 30 to 50 range. And I see a very, very small and incremental increase. And again, it's just, how do you want to spend your budget? And it's kind of up to you to decide based on where you're at in your year, what qualities you want to bias. So again, we test, learn, and apply, we iterate, and we learn how our clients and athletes are responding to these different stimuli. And even if you're in a group environment, you can do the same thing. But you know, leaving on an example, I think it's, I think it's a, a great to use an example of the general population because they're a group with no end, right? It's an infinite game. Training is, is the means to an end and also an end at the same time. It's, you know, if you want to get really philosophical about it, but I'm rarely going to put all my eggs into one basket, right? So my goal is going to be, how can I slowly bring up these qualities over time? So I might look at, you know, someone whose goal is weight loss, someone whose goal is health and longevity to get back to their old athletic self, whatever it might be, I'm looking at improving their movement options. So, you know, improving their ability to access different ranges of motion, doing something powerful or explosive, you know, quote unquote, so jumps and throws, something where I'm producing force fast. I'm going to do something where I produce force slow, like some heavy strength work. I'm going to do something for hypertrophy and work capacity because everyone wants to look good naked. I'm going to do some forms of energy systems development, right? So I'm going to expose them to different energy system zones. And then I'm going to add in some form of play and, and variability. I mean, you, you didn't think you were going to get a solo fill pod without mentioning play at least once in there. So play is going to be a part of the program. So that's, that's six qualities if my finger counting is correct. So that's a lot of things to train, albeit you know, movement options and, and play and variability are, are fairly easy things to implement and can, can be done while training these other qualities. But I think about this as in Dan John's park bench versus bus bench 
analogy, right? So most of the year, I'm just training all the qualities, right? So I, I might lean for the general population. I'm probably going to lean towards biasing strength and hypertrophy. So a couple contacts of jumps and throws, spending a lot of my money, probably $60 out of my 100 on strength and hypertrophy, maybe you know 10 to 20 on, on ESD, depending on the person in the phase, and then you know 10 on mobility, 10 on play and, and, and variability. And again, play can easily fall in line with jumps and throws. It can easily fall in line with movement options, and it can easy fall, easily fall in line with our ESD that we're doing. But back to Dan John's park bench versus bus bench. You know, when you're thinking about a park bench, you're just sitting on the park bench, you're chilling, watching the birds, feeding the squirrels, just vibing. But when you're sitting on a bus bench, you know that the bus is coming at 204 and it's going to get me to my destination at 212, right? You need that to happen. So my park bench is, I'm just almost equal allocation or maybe again, biasing strength and hypertrophy. You know, most of the year, I'm not trying to you know, maximize adaptation for one thing. But then as we move towards a specific goal, an easy one is, you know, beach season, you know, January one comes around. You're just like, all right, you know, I got, I got my, I got my little vacation plan. I got my little Jersey shore trip plan. You know what I'm saying? With the boys and, you know, I'm trying to look good on the beach. All right. Well, shoot, let's try to maximize adaptation with more of a bus bench strategy. Right. So I might spend $70 on hypertrophy during this and everything else is on the super back burner. So maybe I'm doing just jumps as a warm up, like two sets, one set and throws. Maybe I'm just doing, I work up to a moderately heavy single on back squat and then I do some volume back squatting. I work up to a moderately heavy single on bench press and I do some volume bench pressing. And then my ESD, maybe it's just zone two on recovery days, right? So I'm doing some longer duration, slow and steady stuff. Right. And maybe at the end of my workouts, I'll throw on a little play and, and, and variability just to get the heart rate up. But most of my time is spent on hypertrophy. That's the thing I want to maximize. And, you know, I, I think I've heard a fair amount of track coaches and, and, and powerlifting coaches talk about this, this idea of peaks and valleys. But the thing with the bus bench program is that it's taxing both from a, you know, neurological and physical standpoint, neurological, depending on the goal, but definitely from a physical standpoint, but also from a psychological standpoint, like training hard for multiple, multiple months. As you can imagine, it's hard, right? It's hard to continue to do. So with that in mind, you know, we can't just try to maximize adaptation all year round. So after you, we go through this beast season bus branch program, where I'm really trying to, you know, put all my eggs in this basket or, or most of my budget in this basket, then I go right back into maintaining, or sorry, I go right back into my, my park bench program, which is going to be spreading my my dollars out my my adaptation currency my budget out a little bit more evenly and the best part about when i go back is i've touched some heavy strength stuff i've done some jumps i've been doing some esd so now i'm taking advantage of the repeated bout effect i can slide right back into that program seamlessly no issues from a technical standpoint and from a physical standpoint right so hopefully this did not sound like the complete ramblings of a crazy person, um, but damn, if I don't love me some vertical integration. So as always, if you're rocking with the show, please leave your boys, or, or I guess in this case, your boy, uh, a, a five-star rating. Leave us a little review. Tell JT, come on home. Come on home, JT. Come on home, baby. It's not safe out there. Come back to the States. Come back to your boy. Uh, you can find me on, on IG at Nashville. You can find the show on IG and YouTube at Push and Performance with no G. Don't worry. JT will be back here next week. I'll catch y'all next time. Peace. Peace.